Hello and welcome to the Legends of Opera, where we shall be delving into the lives of the incredible singers who have given us the heritage of opera. Mario Lanza, the son of an Italian grocer who loved opera, became beloved around the world and brought opera to the people through the medium of film. If there is one thing that Mario Lanza achieved, it was to bring opera to a far wider audience, and for that he must be acclaimed. Mario Lanza was the first crossover artist. He was the first and arguably the greatest. He inspired Pavarotti, Domingo, and Carreras as young boys. His beautiful tenor voice and engaging personality brought opera to the homes of millions when these films were played on television. <laughs> People adored him. Singers who performed with him said he had the most beautiful voice. He was a wonderful singer. He was very available. If you wanted to hear a tenor, it would be him. There's almost no other opera singer who's had that massive mainstream reach and really shown people who wouldn't have otherwise seen opera the power of the form. <laughs> He started off his opera career at Tanglewood with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. The New York Times said that Lanza had few equals among the tenors of the day. But Hollywood claimed him when he sang in Los Angeles, and MGM offered him a lucrative contract. He could have been an opera great on the stages of the world, but instead he became a legend of cinema. Mario Lanza was born Alfredo Arnold Cocozza in 1921 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The year, significantly, was the year when Caruso died, when you think that uh, Lanza went on to make the film The Great Caruso. He was the son of Italian immigrants. Like so many Italian immigrants, singing meant the world to them. His parents were Antonio Cocotza and Maria Lanza, and he was an only child. His father was a grocer, but he loved Italian opera. And so Mario Lanza grew up listening to all these fabulous performances, these fabulous recordings, and was a particular fan of Ernesto Caruso. His mother, Maria, in fact, was a great soprano and would have had a career um, as a professional singer had it not been for the fact that her father disapproved of women singing. They encouraged Alfredo come Mario to sing. They saw a, a sort of a spark of talent in the boy. So he was surrounded by opera, he was encouraging opera, and despite being, you know, a working class steel town kid, he, his grocer father kind of helped him become an opera star. It's astounding to me when I review the past um, how many sacrifices my mother and father made and sacrifices, really, that were tremendous sacrifices. <laughs> At school, he was quite competitive. He did boxing and weightlifting, but also he pursued his singing. It was very obvious, even from his sort of earlier years, his teenage years, that singing was going to be a large part of his life. A young Mario loved to sing, and he had a job moving pianos in order to pay for his musical training, and he ended up with singing competitions as well. At the age of 21, 
Lanza was noticed by the Boston Symphony Orchestra's conductor, Serge Kusevitsky. Under his guidance, Lanza won a scholarship to the Berkshire Music Center in Tanglewood, Massachusetts, the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. It was here that Lanza made his stage debut in The Merry Wives of Windsor. Mario Lanza sang in The Merry Wives of Windsor at Tanglewood. And at that point, he decided to change his name. So he was no longer Alfredo. After his mother, he called himself Mario Lanza because her name was Maria Lanza, and it sounded like that. So it was a tribute to her. His appearance in The Merry Wives of Windsor, plus all the um, concerts he was giving, came to the attention of the press. And they realized that he was a big opera star in the making. The opera news critic, Herbert Graff, said that he would have no difficulty in gaining a place at the Met Opera. Also at Tanglewood, he appeared in Act Three of Puccini's La Boheme as Rodolfo, and the critic complimented the great beauty of his voice. It's a real meteoric rise. One minute he's entering competitions, and the next minute he's on stage in this great and important place. The audiences are really very expert, and they love him. <laughs> Mario Lanza was swiftly becoming one of opera's most promising new stars. His meteoric rise was to be interrupted, however, by the USA's entry into World War II. He was conscripted for the US Army Air Corps Special Services. Although this means his professional career takes a hiatus, he's still performing because he performs very regularly for the troops in all kinds of performances and all kinds of shows. Soft in the tree sighs the echo of my longing While all around you my dreams of rapture throng This is not just the elite audiences of Tanglewood. This is big audiences and how to entertain a, a much more a wide variety of different people in different ways. After the war ended and Lanza was discharged from service, he eagerly resumed his professional singing career. His singing career really started to take off after the war. He got married to a lady called Betty Hicks. He then went to Atlantic City for a concert with NBC's radio symphony orchestra. From there, he joined CBS for a series of six shows called Great Moments in Music. He performed subsequently with the NBC symphony orchestra which was the orchestra of the great Arturo Toscanini, so that would have reached a great many people. And of course, he was becoming a real presence when it came to American radio. So he's becoming a recognizable voice on the radio for millions of Americans. Mario spends a year working with the great voice teacher Enrico Rosati. He works very hard. Around this time, he comes to the attention of Arthur Judson of Columbia Artist Management, and he forms the bel canto trio with a wonderful soprano and a wonderful baritone, and they just tour and tour and tour. He embarks on an 86-city tour of the whole of, of North America, actually, Mexico, the United States, Canada, He's just touring and working and singing, and he brings great arias to ordinary people. The critics were starting to say not only was he a great singer, but that he had something that no other tenor had ever had. He had a warmth, he had a depth, he had a passion in his voice that went beyond mere technique. <laughs> One particular tour date proved to be life-changing for Lanza, when in August 1947, he performed at the Hollywood Bowl in California. The 
film producer, studio head Louis B. Mayer was present. He was so impressed with Mario Lanza that he thought that he might have found the singing version of Clark Gable and basically offered him a contract, seven year contract for MGM. He signs him up, plus he gives him a bonus and decides to build an entire genre of film, actually, around this young man. Before committing himself to making movies full-time, Mario Lanza continued to extensively tour America, bringing the magic of opera to the public. He began working with RCA on a series of operatic recordings, and in fact won the National Record Critics Association award for best operatic performance for his recording of Your Tiny Hand is Frozen from La Boheme. In 1948, he appeared in New Orleans in the performance of Madame Butterfly and got rave reviews, including one critic said, rarely have we seen a more romantic leading tenor. You know, in a sense, this was kind of a crossroads for him because he was singing. He was on the stage, he was singing. But he decided to go with the movies. You can't throw MGM under the bus, so he decides to go with it, and he keeps his head in the movies. For you. I know. Mario Lanza made his starring film debut in 1949's That Midnight Kiss. With Mary and the gang, come on! I'm gonna take a shower. Tell him to come in there and bring the orchestra with him. Now listen, you dope. Come here. Get in there. They're in there. It's our big moment. Come on. Listen, will you come on? I'm tired. I thought you were kidding. Mr. Dinetti, mystery too. You are not an easy man to find. I'm sorry, Maestro. I thought Artie was, you know, just saying you were here. I came to hear you sing. You did? Mm -hmm. well, what would you like me to sing? Anything you like. Well, how about uh, Una Furtiva Lagrima? Mm, yes, but just the last part. <laughs> OK. That Midnight Kiss sets the tone for uh, Mario's Hollywood career which is a plot usually about a working class kid who sings opera. And it's about the moment that he discovers his operatic voice. So people go and the first few minutes of all of these films don't have any opera in it. It's just got Mario, everyone's waiting for him to sing. And the plot then really evolves broadly in the same way about his voice. It's kind of autobiographical. A lot of his films, even though he didn't write them, they're about him. They're about a working class boy who can sing. It was just an amazing hit. Everyone loved it. He was on his way. What's extraordinary about this first film and his first appearance in film is the confidence that he has on the screen. Lendor, 
That midnight kiss was a major success with audiences. Having fallen in love with Lanza's voice on the radio, they rushed to see this handsome matinee idol on the screen. Bosley Crowther, who was the famous New York Times critic, wrote that MGM had launched a beaming new tenor. The great thing about this was that it was a musical, and musicals, of course, were, there were lots of musicals around, but there were very few that actually had an operatic star at its heart. He was seen as playing in this fabulous role, a juicy role, as the New York Times called it. It was a great debut. He was on his way to Hollywood stardom. Lanza returned to cinemas one year later in the toast of New Orleans. Hey, he's pretty good. But what's he singing about? I can't understand the words. It's in Italian. Oh. He's supposed to be her lover. He's a lover? The fat one? Yeah, the Nicky. A lover? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Lanza's great success in 1950 was in The Toast of New Orleans, a movie about opera singers in the south of America, and he played the Bayou fisherman, Pepe. Again, it's about a man who is in perhaps impoverished circumstances, who is, lives roughly, who's actually just gifted with his amazing voice, who is then discovered by a passing opera singer, again, Catherine Grayson. In this film, he sings arias from Carmen, La Traviata and Madame Butterfly. with Catherine Grayson, but that didn't go so well. They played in his first film, That Midnight Kiss, together. But by this point, Catherine Grayson and Mario Lanza really weren't getting on very well, and she refused to play with him ever again. He did a song called Be My Love, which came out as a single and was the first million-selling single by an operatic singer. Extraordinary. Be my love for no one else. After just two films, Mario Lanza had become an international star. However, growing criticism from the opera community had led Lanza to begin doubting these professional choices. This is where he really begins to reach the huge mass market, but it's also where the opera community start to doubt him, and they start to think, is this really the appropriate career for someone with a voice as great as that? The opera world was starting to get him. He was beginning to suffer as a result of internal leg because he was being got at because of this massive, massive success.
Mario Lanza had become the first opera singer to also be a major Hollywood star. In 1951, he recorded an album covering songs originally performed by his idol, Enrico Caruso. In the same year as the album's release, Lanza starred in a biopic of Caruso's life. You will be the big boss. The flour mill will be yours. This house, everything I have, if you use your head. You're very generous, senor, but... I... But? Enrico, listen to Papa. I have listened to Papa. Perhaps for a minute someone will listen to me. It is true, senor Barreto, that right now I sing for Penny. Pennies are not very important in a big house like this. But the singing, that is important everywhere. It makes people feel good inside. It takes away the ugliness, the sadness, and it fills the empty place here. That too is something, senor, isn't it? Audiences loved it, and MGM had a big hit on their hands. They knew they had a superstar. It must have been a dream role for him. The film was the biggest film of the year. It had enormous box office success. It achieved enormous critical success. And it established Mario Lanza for once and all as the greatest operatic movie star of his generation. It is a huge success. However, the Caruso family were upset with it because it was not absolutely accurate. They were very upset. They tried to sue MGM. It was a big kerfuffle. But years later, Enrico Caruso Jr., a tenor in his own right, said of Mario Lanza that he was perfect. He said this guy was absolutely flawless, and uh, his father would have been proud of this performance. He was a great fan of Mario Lanza. <laughs> It was a great entry-level film for people who hadn't necessarily embraced opera wholeheartedly to begin to explore the world of it. The great Caruso inspired a generation, really, of opera singers. Pavarotti, uh, Domingo, they went to the cinema, they saw the film, they went back and they repeated the songs at home. It even inspired Frank Sinatra. It shaped a sound for a generation. Mario Lanza definitely had an effect on the three tenors. They've admitted as, as much. The Great Caruso was a massive financial success, becoming MGM's biggest release of the year. In the opera community, however, outspoken criticism and resentment continued to grow. Time magazine did a cover story about Mario Lanza, which kind of established him as, as the man of the moment. It was that point when he clearly had revolutionized opera singing and had brought it in front of a public who had never really heard opera in the past. This was wonderful for uh, his public. It was wonderful for record sales. It was wonderful for opera generally. Of course, the opera elite absolutely hated it. They loathed him for it, despised him for it, because they f always feel that opera belongs with the highbrows. It belongs in the opera house. It has no business being on the movie screen. Time uh, magazine said uh, something like this guy appeals to Bobby Soxers, the teenagers of the day, housewives, everybody. But then the opera world says, you know, why are you at Metro Goldwyn Mayer? You should be at the Met. 
that that's a proper opera singer. And so time really puts out in the open, in public, the controversy that had been raging in the opera world for a couple of years by now, and which was basically eating Mario alive. The stress Lanza was experiencing began to show in his behavior on set when he shot his next film for MGM, Because You're Mine. Because you're mine, the brightest star I see looks down my love and envies me. Because you're mine, because you're mine. In 1952, Because You're Mine was released. That was a movie starring Lanza about an opera singer who was drafted into the US Army, so very close to his personal experience. It was a great hit. The song from the title, Because You're Mine, it sold a million copies. It was nominated for Best Original Song at the Academy Awards. But it was quite a difficult period for Lanza to film this. At this point, he's not happy. The reception he's got from the opera world, the people he loves, the world he wants respect from is starting to affect him. He's also struggling with the, the atmosphere in Hollywood and his weight starts to fluctuate. He starts to put it on and take it off. And during filming, this is noticeable. In fact, you can see it on screen, his weight changes. And the wardrobe department had to battle with this and try to overcompensate for his wildly fluctuating weight. So this is where you start to see him begin to come apart at the scenes. The film, along with all the others, was a huge success. Everybody loved it. Interestingly enough, both his parents appear in the film. His father hasn't anything to say, but his mother actually goes up to him and asks for his autograph, which is a nice little ironic touch. Oh, Mr. Rossano, I heard you sing Pagliacci. May I have your autograph? Go right ahead, Mr. Rossano, please. Give the lady your autograph. Oh, uh, has one of you gentlemen a paper and a pencil? There you are. Plenty of time, have it with gentlemen. Overhead the moon is beating. Despite being a guaranteed box office draw with audiences, Mario Lanza continued to have disagreements on set, leading to intervention from the MGM studio bosses. Mario Lanza was next contracted to make The Student Prince. Lanza recorded all the songs for the film before he actually made it, and they are regarded as among the greatest of his recordings. The director of the film, Curtis Bernhardt, however, didn't like what he was doing with the songs, especially in the early part of the film, because he said they weren't in the character of the prince. Lanza took great objection to this. He didn't mind being directed as an actor, but he, he didn't want any film director telling him how to sing. They had a huge argument, and the end of it was that Lanza walked off the set. Louis B. Mayer had died, and so Lanza's great protector was no longer around. And so, essentially, he was then fired by MGM and then sued by them for five million, and this was a very difficult time. What happened after that was the soundtrack was used with Maria Lanza's voice, and that Edmund Purdom, who took over the role of the student prince himself, would lip sync it, which he did rather well. Drifting along in my heart, there's a song, and the song in my heart will not fail. actually quite a hit, as it turned out, because people still wanted to hear his voice, but it affected Lanza terribly because part of the terms of the deal was that he would not appear in any film anywhere for the next three years. This day on, 
Mario Lanza was left devastated by the way he'd been treated by MGM, unable to work in the movies for three years and with a family to provide for. He built up heavy debts and frequently turned to alcohol. Lanza finally returned to cinema screens in 1956. I understand you finish here at midnight. After the quartet. I wonder if you'd care to join us for a little supper. Us? I thought possibly you would notice the young woman I was sitting with. I'm a tenor. I noticed. In 1956, Lanza played in what was going to be his comeback, Serenade, based on the book by James M. Cain about an opera singer who falls in love with two different women, very different women. One was Joan Fontaine, the other was Sara Montiel. Uh, this was going to be his comeback, the great moment. But although it was quite well received by critics, it was a real flop at the box office, and it seemed very much to Lanza that his big movie career was over. He got to sing with Licia Albanese, who was a young soprano, and she heard on the opera circuit that he couldn't do the business. He couldn't sing in an opera house. That's why he wasn't there. And she said years later, he had an incredible voice. He inspired her. He was a great teacher for her. And she said he had the most. I mean, she never heard a voice like that, ever. For some reason or other, this did not catch fire with the public. It was his first box office failure. But there are sequences that are just breathtaking, and there's a scene in a church, and he starts singing Ave Maria. It is one of the most beautiful recordings of Ave Maria I've ever heard. Mario Lanza decided that his career in Hollywood was over. Feeling that he was better off pursuing work elsewhere, he relocated his family to Europe, making his new home in Rome. In 1957, he shot the European production, Seven Hills of Rome. Sometimes it seems it will break your heart When you must sell such a work of art For art is something that you should give But you have to eat to live Are you get them, man? Tonight, tonight is a party Tonight There's gonna be a party tonight we'll have to be So here. let's invite everybody Tonight And bring along your appetite ah! Seven Hills of Rome is a film about a working-class Italian-American who moves to Italy and sings opera. It's a great film, and it was a great film. Everybody loved it. Briefly, he was, it was like he was back. It was a sigh of relief, perhaps, for him, because it did well at the box office as well. He was earning. He could, he could, you know, he could afford to relax and take things easy, but it, he, was, he still had whatever demons were burning him up were still there, but briefly, it looked like everything was okay. There's a remarkable scene in the Seven Hills of Rome in which he sings Arrivederci Roma with a little girl. The little girl who was actually just a street urchin. It was someone he found, he just discovered on the streets and wanted, and he heard her singing. And he said, yes, you can come and sing with me. And so she appears in a film with Mario Lanza. <laughs> Down the street. 
The success of Seven Hills of Rome showed the passion with which audiences still regarded Mario Lanza. In response, Lanza once again took to the road, starting in London, where he received a very warm welcome. Well, this time only until the 26th of November. Are you coming back again? Yes, I hope to come back to live here for a while. Oh, really? Yes, I mean it. <laughs> Are you going to be singing any arias for the Queen? Well, um, let's leave it as a secret, huh? <laughs> He's invited to perform at the London Palladium, the Royal Variety Performance. He's presented to the Queen. Uh, he embarks on a 22-city tour around Europe, plays every place. Returning to Rome, Lanza received offers to perform at some of the country's most prestigious opera houses. When he went back to Italy, Opera Rome and Opera Naples wanted to work with him. He was offered the choice of parts at the, both of them. He recorded the soundtrack to his next movie at Opera Rome. He still had it. He still, as far as European opera was concerned, he still had the voice, he still had the range, he still had the power, he still had the talent. And so they were eager to work with him. In 1959, for the first time was released, another MGM movie about an opera singer who falls in love with a deaf woman. And Lanza again in the lead role as Tonio Costa. Come prima, come prima, I'm in love. Come prima, come prima, I found love. From the moment I saw you, I was in rapture. Every moment after that, I live in the clouds. This was a real departure because a lot of his work before had been very much along the romantic comedy, the musical comedy, the, the big performance. And the critics really noted how it was a very moving film, how it was a real emotional change. He was not well. He was, he was suffering from a variety of health conditions, partly to do with his weight, but also his heart. He wasn't delivering a, the finest Mario Lanza performance available, but even so, even in America, uh, the New York Times critic Howard Thompson said, no, this is great. Perhaps there's a pathos to it that we see that, we, that isn't deliberately upfront, but we, there is something mournful about that film. There is almost, if you're unduly superstitious, you can almost see the, 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 the presaging of his tragedy. Vesti. Sadly, for the first time, was Mario Lanza's last appearance on cinema screens as the performer's health began to rapidly decline. Lanza had been unwell for several years and he really took a turn for the worst in April 1959 and he checked into a clinic in Rome, the Valle Giulia Clinic, and never left. He had some controversial remedies while he was there and died of a heart attack. It's interesting that Caruso died at 48 and Maria Lanza died at 38. Lanza's widow was devastated by his death and tragically committed suicide just five months later, leaving their four children as orphans. Mario Lanza passed away on October 7, 1959. Rumors of suspicious circumstances surrounding his death have circulated ever since. There wasn't an autopsy after he died, and that was where the rumors began that he'd been killed by the Mafia. Certainly, the Mafia were deeply involved in Hollywood. No one really has made the serious claim that he was working with the Mafia or that he was paid by the Mafia or that they had any, any ownership over him. So it is a bit of a stretch to say he was killed by the Mafia. And also, why would he have been killed by the Mafia? But it's a rumour which helps, in a way, helps detract from the, from the truth of his voice. These stories about his 
and Wade, these stories about the Mafia, or the stories about his tragic life, they all detract from the fact that you can sit back and enjoy this astonishing voice on film forever. In just nine years on screen, Mario Lanza had appeared in eight films, was universally loved by audiences, and had become an inspiration for a whole generation. Lanza really was a great crossover talent. He was both an actor and a great opera singer. He really brought opera to the masses in post-war America. So many of our great opera singers, if you weren't there for one of their big performances at the Met or Covent Garden, you never really understood their genius. But Lanza was different. His genius was in recordings. It was on the silver screen. And so his life, his opera life, his singing, his charisma lives on and will never die. He was a wonderful singer. And I think had he lived beyond 38, you know, a lot of the recordings that were made with other tenors would have been made with him instead. Because Mario Lanza was such a huge hit, because he had this huge appeal across the whole of the country, across the whole of the world, lots of people discovered opera through him. There is absolutely no question that Lanza changed the concept of what opera could be. It's very difficult to realise at this stage just how big a star he was, and he was an enormous star. For someone whose career was so relatively brief, he burned very brightly indeed and his legacy is absolutely extraordinary. Seven.